Hi everyone! Welcome to episode 4 of the Shiro's Project. I'm Anika Iyer and I am very excited to be here with today's Shiro, Sarah Clatterbuck. Hey everyone! Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about Sarah before we start. Sarah is currently a Director of Engineering at LinkedIn where she leads engineering for six different teams in application infrastructure. Prior to joining LinkedIn, Sarah was um, a manager, an engineering manager at Yahoo, and she also held roles at companies like Packetier, Apple, and two startups. Sarah is also a board member of the Girl Scouts of Northern California, where she is working on exposing 15,000 young girls to um, computer science and development of an innovation career through some new initiatives. And Arshiro is also a seasoned athlete. She was an avid basketball player and track runner throughout high school, and now as an adult, she's a competitive runner, triathlete, and cyclist. Thanks again, Sarah, for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited. So you have had quite the journey into the tech industry. You joined Resonate, Resonate sorry, as a full-stack web developer in 1999, which is no mean task, mm -hmm. having gained all of your technical knowledge through independent coursework. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, both your degree from the Academy of Art University and um, USF were both in advertising, which is a different field entirely. Could you tell us a little bit about what caused the shift in your career path and also what inspired you to take up computer science? Yeah, absolutely. Um, those, those of the folks that I work with closely know the story well, so hopefully none of you are getting this as a repeat online. Um, but I actually have always been a bit of a mathematician and artist both, and I did really well in math throughout high school and was considering majoring in math uh, and then alternatively majoring in applied design advertising be, being the specific area of applied design. And I sort of came down on the side of doing design because I see myself as a very creative person. And as I was going through college, I started becoming an early adopter of technology. Um, this was sort of early days of doing digital design work and really excelled at that. And a professor recommended me for an internship at a software startup. Mm -hmm. And so my job at the software startup initially was to do technical support as an intern. And they had um, an early version of a WYSIWYG program for making web pages and it behaved much like the design software that I had been, become accustomed to using so they thought I would be really skilled at providing technical support mm -hmm. and the other thing they thought was that while I was there I should go take some programming classes so I would understand sort of how the software worked under the hood uh, which might give me some more insights into the problems that customers were having. And so they sent me to a, a few programming courses and then I ended up working there full time throughout my senior year of college and that's where I really got the programming bug. I had I'd only done a tiny bit of programming um, in eighth grade. Uh, we did a short course uh, and did like a um, well, I'll talk about that some more later. Yeah. Uh, but I'll, I'll save that for a surprise. I'd only <laughs> had a tiny bit of exposure early in junior high and then had none until this internship, and that's where the bug bit me. And when I came out of school, I initially went into an ad agency and worked as an art director, but they were like, oh, you know how to develop web pages. All of our customers want web pages. Could you do that instead? And so that was how I sort of got started doing it professionally. And um, then I decided I would move to Silicon Valley and just do that full time. Yeah, I mean, that's an in incredibly unique journey, different from many that I've heard. And I think it's especially inspiring for many young girls who perceive pursuing a career or an education in computer science and engineering as intimidating or even too challenging to get into if you know you don't start right off the bat in yeah. like middle school or high school or whatever it is. So I think it would actually be great for many of us to hear about what you enjoy most about programming. I would love if you could share some examples of technical projects that you've really enjoyed working on, some tools that you might have used, and some skills that you've gained along the way. Sure. 
Um, so I think what I like most about programming, and I think this is why I sort of joined the two sides of my personality, is that it really is creative. Like, you can solve a specific problem any number of ways, and your job as an engineer is to come up, you know, with the way that best suits, you know, whatever your requirements are. So whether you have a requirement for elegance, for efficiency of time complexity, for efficiency of space complexity, you know, there are a million different ways to approach a single problem and that's where the creativity comes in. Um, I think also, like, I really love as being an engineer solving real world problems. So what I've really started to focus on with my career in the last few years is essentially working for companies that have sort of audacious goals in the world to solve not just interesting technical problems and so that's that's how I landed here at LinkedIn um, and we have a vision to create economic opportunity for the entire global workforce which I find very inspiring so I, I, I like to apply my technical skills towards sort of mission-driven areas. Um, in terms of specific interesting projects that I've worked on over the years, I think the first really ambitious thing that I built was I was working at um, Packetier and basically they wanted to build a lead generation system. So marketing wanted to be able to create these landing pages. I mean, this is a very common thing now, but uh, and there's a lot of software that's pre-packaged to solve this, but at the time, that didn't exist. And so marketing wanted to have these landing pages where people could come and find out something interesting about the products, express interest in the products, and then that data needed to flow through a few different systems. So um, the data needed to flow, you know, through the website, and so there was sort of that web app that we needed to build, um, and then the databases behind that. But then also we had to create an offline process that would essentially take all that data uh, n number of times per day and put it into our sales CRM system. Mm -hmm. And then we further extended that system to uh, uh, be able to write data into our uh, customer support part of the CRM system as well. And so I had never worked on any that connected so many different systems and I learned a lot about relational database design in that project. Uh, so I had been more focused in the application layer previous and I really got yeah. some exposure to the data layer and doing sort of online data systems and offline systems. Um, I think at Yahoo I got to work on a number of really interesting projects. I worked initially on um, what was supposed to be a brand new front end for Yahoo Groups, uh, yeah. which never actually <laughs> made it to the public. And so, uh, you know, that's that's another interesting thing about it, being an engineer is sometimes you work on stuff that never ships, and that's <laughs> an interesting thing. Um, but that was a cool project because we were basically taking a pretty ancient uh, database system and adding a REST API layer on top of it and then like a whole new front end starting with a PHP MVC and then going up uh, all the way to the JavaScript layer and putting in a lot of interactivity. Um, since being at LinkedIn, I've worked on a, a few really interesting projects. Um, I was part of the initial team that built our sales navigator platform, so was part of the early thinking about that product as well as how to approach it technically. Um, I also have been able to take classes to learn iOS development, which has been really exciting to kind of expand my technical horizons, even being in a management role. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually got to contribute to our onboarding flow in our flagship app after I took my oh. classes. So oh. that was fun. Um, and, and here, I think another initiative that I've been really proud of is working on getting our company 
started with accessibility, so bringing in the technical expertise to make our products usable for people with all different abilities mm -hmm. and uh, be able to support like screen readers and keyboard navigation and uh, different types of touch interactions on our mobile apps. That's been a lot of the work that I've done here. Um, and then more recently, our, our latest sort of architecture that we've been building here for our apps, uh, which is Ember on top of Play framework. Um, so really getting to know in depth what it is to build a single page app and, okay. to, um, and to build the infrastructure that supports that type of app development. So. Um, a lot of really cool projects. Yeah, it's a fascinating <laughs> range of projects as well. I'd like to take you back now to mm -hmm. what stood out to me as a pivotal point in your career. Mm -hmm. um, when after you had worked as a developer for a few years and you had established your career at companies like Apple and Resonate and mm -hmm. Packetier, you decided to return to school. So was this difficult? Um, and also, in terms of making the decision process and actually returning to school, what were some things that excited you, surprised you, challenged you? Yeah, um, that was an interesting process. So I had been thinking about it for quite some time. Obviously, I had gone into a career that my education didn't immediately qualify me for um, and had learned a lot on my own. But for a few years leading up to going back to school, I had been trying to look for a program that I could do concurrent with working, um, and either in the information science or the computer science arena. And um, I landed on this information science program at San Jose State, which could be done mostly um, remotely, which was right. great. Um, so I think what, what surprised me, I think it was really interesting because I had always had this doubt about myself. Well, you're not really qualified to be doing what you're doing because you don't have the educational credentials and you need to go get those. And it turned out that once I was in this program, like, I actually knew a lot of stuff already. <laughs> yeah. uh, and like there was this one class where I practically felt like I could actually teach the professor some things about <laughs> relational databases because he was like suggesting that we put redundant data in this one part of our database design. And I was like, um, I don't think that's a great idea. <laughs> Here's why. Um, so that that was what really surprised me. I think I also sort of was surprised at my capacity for doing work because you know you never know how much you can actually do until you kind of try to to take more on and so it was incredibly difficult to work full time and go to school uh, but then I realized well I actually there is some time management efficiency that I can yeah. gain, and uh, and I am actually capable of going harder at times than I thought I was. No, that's. I think it's a decision that almost every student ends up having to make at some point. So, it's very helpful and interesting to listen to different perspectives and different decision processes that others have been through. So, yeah. thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to move to another very interesting perspective. I think you hold, and one that's unique to a lot of um, technical women that I've met, your experience as an athlete and mm -hmm. how that has shaped your career. Um, I would love if you could talk about what you've learned from being a competitive athlete, especially um, you know after just high school and college, continuing that into your um, adult career as well, and how you translate what you learn in that sphere to other spheres of your life. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you just heard me talk about going hard. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's one thing that you learn as an athlete is that um, you actually can't progress as an athlete unless you are able to push harder than you have in the past or harder than what is your sort of sustainable uh, rate that you can go at. And so I think that's been one thing I've been able to apply to my career is that you have to go hard. But then on the flip side, you actually have to rest and recover. And you have to have periods where you back off and um, you reflect and you, you actually get mental rest and physical rest. And so um, 
that's that's something I'm always working on tuning. Um, I'm a huge proponent of sleep. I sleep at least eight hours a night, sometimes more. Uh, I need that rest to recharge my mind, uh, to repair my body after yeah. I have hard workouts, but also of taking like really recharging breaks in vacations, um, really trying to be offline during that time, um, and really be focused on something that's very different from what I do day to day. That's that's another thing. Um, and then also in in my professional life, like I can't um, allow my calendar to be completely chock full all the time. If I do that, then I'm constantly in this reactive mode and I need to approach my professional calendar in the way that I approach my training calendar and like buffer in times for reflection and buffer in times for learning new technology and, and things that aren't part of my day-to-day -day immediate responsibilities. Yeah, no, it's I think that's something that's often overlooked and not emphasized enough, especially for college students and, you know, people moving into their careers for the first time. Yeah. So before we move into the interactive Q&A, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about your deep involvement with bridging the gender divide mm. in technology especially. So you have worked on a number of different initiatives, women in tech initiatives at LinkedIn. You yep. mentored a high school, a team of high school girls through the Technovation program and building an Android app, and you're working to expose more girls to computer science through your work on the board of directors for Girl Scouts. Yeah. So why is this cause personally so important to you, and what do you hope to gain through the work that you're doing? Well, I think it's personally really important because I believe that the products that are coming out of technology, the solutions that are coming out of technology, um, don't reflect the entire wisdom and um, collective brain power of our entire society. And that doesn't just mean gender, that means, you know, people from different cultures and different backgrounds. Um, I think we have a very narrow set of people focused on the world's problems, and the more that we can bring in diversity into the thought process behind these things, like the more innovative um, and compelling solutions we're going to come up with. So I think there's that. Um, I also think that I really think about opportunity and you know, engineering and technical careers present a great opportunity for success, for uh, having a really exciting, challenging career, for having financial independence, and like, why should women be um, left behind from that amazing opportunity that this career area provides? Yeah, definitely. I think one quote that I've heard numerous times in the past few years that has really resonated with um, my dedication to the cause is people solve the problems they see. Mm -hmm. And it makes so much sense because all this, the power and the leveraging possibilities of technology come from its ability to solve problems that you can't solve yeah. otherwise. But if the people that are working on solving those problems don't have experiences that represent the rest of the population, then we are limiting ourselves so much to the types of problems and the scope of problems that we can solve. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much, Shara, Sarah, sorry, for sharing your thoughts with us so far. I'd now like to open it up to all the interactive members for the second half um, and the Q&A session. So please take it away with your questions. Hi, um, I'm Gillian. I'm a rising sophomore at MIT, and I'm going to be majoring in computer science. And so you've broken a lot of barriers with regards to being a woman in technology, which I'm sure has had its fair share of challenges. However, I'm particularly interested in hearing about your experiences breaking the barriers of being a woman in leadership. What have been the most significant challenges that you've faced with regards to being a female leader? That's a great question. Um, I think one of the challenges I faced is just having the right presence and confidence in a lot of different conversations, and that's something I've had to work on. So I think my sort of default demeanor is um, 
sort of joyful and happy and I tend to smile a lot and that can actually diminish my presence in the way that I speak about things in in a in an executive setting and so that's something I've had to work on where you know uh, I actually had some coaches who pointed out some different behaviors to me and helped me practice not doing some things and and to take on different behaviors um, so that's been one area of challenge I think Otherwise, it's it's really been uh, I, I think a very supportive environment of me as a leader. I think you, know, um, the companies that I've worked at have all wanted me to succeed, and I feel like I've been really well supported with mentors and champions along the way to to help me succeed. So I think a lot of the work has just been. Um, in my own head, in my own behaviors and presence in terms of being a leader. Thank you. Oh, are we all good? Andrea, would you like to go ahead? Oh, I think you might need to unmute yourself. Um, okay. Okay. Um, you talked a lot about taking time to kind of reflect on the past and move forward into the future and, and learn technologies always moving at such a, a fast pace. And so I was wondering if there's any um, growing field right now or project that you're particularly excited about and looking forward to learning more about. Yeah, so I mean, I think the uh, sort of single page app world is a fun world and user experience. experience. Um, that's, um, that's definitely, definitely boring um, and we'll um, more about. about. We're getting some, some feedback. Uh, okay, all right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, also applying data and machine learning to different things that maybe we haven't tackled with that before is really interesting. So um, one of the things that I've recently been thinking about is how to improve um, the way that a user feels about the responsiveness of our product as they move through the site and actually thinking about, well, could we actually like predict what are the most common paths users take and maybe take some actions to um, make the data more quickly available as they move through those paths. So like applying those types of concepts to maybe new areas uh, and problems is a really interesting thing for me right now. Thank you, I agree. I think the the user is really important and the focus. Also, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Andrea. Um, I'm a rising junior at Duke University studying biomedical engineering. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Sakshi. I'm a rising junior at Cornell, um, also studying computer science. And um, everything you've done working with girls and women and encouraging them in CS is like so inspiring. Um, for someone who's still in college, who doesn't really know how to help, but is passionate about encouraging women in CS, what do you think are like some good things that we can do? So I think like being a community of women and helping each other is really important. So, you know, um, I was just talking about this today, actually, with our class of high school trainees, encouraging them to maybe form a Slack channel that they can all be on, you know, once they go to school and they can, you know, if they're stuck on some algorithm at three in the morning, like talk to each other and get help from each other. So I think whatever we can do to encourage each other uh, as we face different hurdles in our careers, whether that be coursework or uh, whether that be interactions or finding that first job. I think that's that's one really important piece. And then I would also say whatever you receive in terms of mentorship or coaching, 
make sure to pass that on to someone else. So essentially replicate uh, whatever anyone invests in you into the next into the next generation coming behind you. So if you're in college now, like I encourage you to take on a high school student as a mentor, or if you're if you're in the working world, like take on a college student uh, to mentor. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Mitra, if you'd like to go ahead. Oh, I think you need to um, turn on your mic. Hello, my name is Mitra. I do robotics. So as a young girl considering pursuing engineering, I want to know what's the biggest piece of advice you would give? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I think as I think about my own career and how I've learned over the years, um, I really appreciate a talk I heard on YouTube recently by Reshma Sojani. She founded um, Girls Who Code, I believe. Um, and her talk was basically about uh, women needing to be brave more than being perfect. And I think that that's something that I've struggled with um, and, I, and I see a lot of other women struggling with. It's like, we don't want to mess up so we don't try stuff and being a great engineer me means you have to try a lot of things before you find the thing that works um, or if we have you know something that doesn't go as well as we'd like like a, a job interview that we flop on we tend not to get back in the saddle quickly like we let these things kind of reduce our confidence and and our feelings about ourselves being perfect mm -hmm. and so I guess my biggest piece of advice is like be brave don't be afraid to try things to ask questions to to not know the answer all the time I think that's the biggest way to start and to learn okay thank you hi I'm Stephanie um, I'm a rising sophomore at Swarthmore College and I'm also uh, thinking of majoring in computer science. Um, and my question today is just um, outside of your awesome career, um, what different interests and uh, hobbies that you have? Yeah, so I think most of my hobbies are about getting out in the outdoors. Um, so I tend to spend a lot of my spare time not in the digital world, which maybe is a little different from some of the people that I live with. But um, yeah, I love hiking, I love backpacking, cycling, and, um, I love being a competitive athlete when I have time to train. Um, I think beyond that, uh, I really enjoy still pursuing artistic hobbies. So uh, last year I spent some time drawing um, pictures of like the seven or eight countries that I had visited that year just because I wanted to keep my drawing skills fresh as well. Thank you so much, that's awesome. Hi, I'm Ellie. I'm a rising junior at Case Western Reserve University. Um, I'm really, I'm majoring in computer science. I'm really interested in animation and virtual reality. But I was wondering if you could tell me about one of the largest obstacles you've had to face during your career and how you overcame it. Hmm. I think um, probably the largest obstacle was, well, I think there were two possibly. Um, one was the first time I got laid off. That was a little bit terrifying. Um, and this was when I was relatively new to Silicon Valley and I didn't realize that getting laid off was actually an opportunity to go get another job making more money than you, <laughs> you had before. Um, so I was a little bit terrified by that and I think sort of, um, mentally overcoming that was a challenge for me um, and I don't know entirely how I did it I mean I think I just had to get back out there um, but I think you know having that experience made me not fear it as much um, in other circumstances 
Uh, I think the other big challenge, and I alluded to it earlier, was um, you know a couple of times working on things that were really huge, that were really um, I, that I was really invested in, and then having those projects get canceled or uh, or deprioritized. Um, I think that that is something that's really challenging the first time that it happens to you in your career. I think as you gain more experience, you realize that, hey, if the overall uh, mission that you're working towards as an organization is, is better met by you pivoting to another project, mm -hmm. then that's actually a really positive thing. And so I think, you know, kind of being able to frame those types of situations in that light has really helped me overcome them uh, subsequent to the first time, but I think the first time it was a little jarring when it was like I'd spent months and months working on something and then somebody was like, oh, we're not going to do that anymore. That that's, uh, that's a pretty big obstacle, but I think being able to mentally frame as like, Am I still putting my skills towards the larger goals of the organization? Um, that's that's a positive way to spin that. Awesome, thank you. So I know we have one last question from Suzanne. Um, are you able to um, get your microphone on to ask a question? I know there was a little bit of trouble with that earlier. Um, there should be a little mic button on the screen. If you could click it, that might work. Um, oh, oh. Well, um, maybe we can have Suzanne send you her question offline. Yeah, that would be great. I'd yeah. be happy to answer any questions offline that you guys think of. Yeah, that's thank you. That's nice, very nice of you. Um, so with that question, our episode is coming to an end, and. I'm sure we could all sit here and listen to Sarah share more advice and stories, but um, I'm sure you also have to get back to work. So I'd just like to say thanks again so much for joining us and for sharing so much advice and inspiring us, which you certainly have done for this group. And thank you again to our interactive members for tuning in and joining and asking such thoughtful questions. Um, it was great to hear what everyone said and also um, to hear more about your experiences through those questions. Yeah, absolutely. And for all the live viewers, a recording of this episode will be available both on the Shira's Project YouTube channel and on the website shortly. And please do share it with anyone you know who might be interested to help share the word because we'd love to reach as many young girls and young women as we can. Um, if you have a Shiro who you'd like to nominate for a future episode, head over to the website, to the nominate page, and um, you can fill that out and we'll get back to you for more information about that. And one more exciting piece of news is that we are working on kicking off an ambassador program for the Shiro's project. So for young girls and women, college, high school, middle school, um, after college as well, who would like to become more involved and bring the Shiro's project to their own communities, please send an email to the Shiro's project at gmail.com or uh, fill out the contact form on the website and we will certainly be in touch with more details um, in the very near future. Finally, before we close up the episode, I'm excited to announce that our next Shiro will be Jessica McKellar, Director of Engineering at Dropbox. And episode five, featuring Jessica, will air at 4.30 p.m. Pacific time, 7.30 p.m. East Coast time, on August 10th. So please mark your calendars. Thank you so much, and have a great afternoon.